This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to The Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Nick Adams. He is founder and executive director of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, otherwise known as FLAG. He's a columnist for Townhill.com, Centennial Institute Policy Fellow at Colorado Christian University, and author of several books, including The American Boomerang, How the World's Greatest Turnaround Nation We'll do it again. Green Card Warrior and Rethinking America and Class Dismissed, Why College Isn't the Answer. And the new book that comes out tomorrow, Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization. Nick, welcome. How are you? Hello, Jason. It's a pleasure to join you and your listeners. It's good to have you. And you are an Aussie who is now living in Dallas, right? That's correct. I'm an immigrant to the United States of America. I uh, got my Extraordinary Ability Green Card four years ago. I look forward to becoming a citizen next year when I become eligible after my five years of permanent residency has been completed. I wake up every day and thank God that I'm in America. I think the United States is the greatest country in the world. And I'm just really blessed to be here and be a part of the American dream. Well, that's awesome. But hey, Australia's not so bad. I've been there before. I liked Australia. What's wrong with that? Well, Jason, I'm sure that you visited. You didn't live there, probably. (laughs) And uh, it's a totally different kettle of fish when uh, you're talking about living uh, in Australia. And Australia is a nice place, but it's not really a place for somebody that wants to blaze a trail and leave a legacy and and be different and be bold and be brash and and not conform to expectations or conceal their true self. Uh, Australia is a place with a lot of gatekeepers where you're really not the person that's in charge of, you're not the primary author of your destiny. Mm-hmm. You're not really in the driver's seat of your future. That's a, and uh, that's what makes America so yeah. special. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. Just last question, where in Australia did you live? Yeah, a big city that all of your uh, listeners will be familiar with. Sydney. Sydney hosted the 2000 Olympic Games, Summer Olympics, and it's a city of about 5 million people these yeah. days, about 4 million when I was growing up. Uh-huh. So it's a big, big place. Yeah, good, good. It's a beautiful city for sure. But yeah, I get it. America really is a special country. There's no question about it. And, you know, we have listeners in 189 countries. And, you know, I was not born in the U.S., and I just feel that it's a very special place, and I, I feel very lucky to uh, to have that American passport. But, uh, you know, it ain't what it used to be. I, I don't know. You know, your book, The American Boomerang, you call it a turn around, the world's greatest turnaround nation. Now, a lot of people think of turnarounds when they think of companies, right? You know, there are people, corporate people who specialize in being a turnaround specialist. How will America do it again? And by the way, that book is six years old now, so I'm sure there's a little perspective on that too, right? Without a doubt, Jason. Uh, Look, the United States of America, the American culture, I believe has a very uh, interesting resilience. And you see it throughout history whenever the United States of America has been under attack Whenever America has been shoved up against a corner wall in a room, America has emerged bigger and stronger and better than it has before. Now, this is not a new thing at all. Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French nobleman who came out here in the 18th century, famously observed in his sociological masterpiece, Democracy in America, that the true genius of Americans lay in their ability to repair their faults. Now, this was a sentiment that was echoed by 
Winston Churchill, who I suspect we'll speak about a lot later in this uh, podcast. But Churchill famously said that America might be after exhausting every other option. And uh, there is really a, uh, a boomerang spirit to the American people. The culture is such that it's a malleable place. It's a flexible place. Americans have shown themselves to be very adaptive and very adaptable to things that happen in, in life and in the world. And that's why I think America really has got the, the recipe to overcome just about any problem. Mm -hmm. So, Churchill, that was a long time ago, World War II. America definitely has a, a different set of people in it now and pretty different set of values. Is that all still true? Well, I think so, Jason, because it's really the more the model and from the model emanates the culture and emanates the thinking and emanates the value system. And if you go and have a look at the United States of America, it was the US Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, our founding fathers and, and the values that they projected onto America. I think that that's what's enabled the flexibility and the malleability and the greatness and the ambition and the risk taking and all of the things that we associate being American, I think comes from that. So while there might be a different set of people now living in the United States of America, the thinking, the value, the approach, all of that kind of stuff, I think all of it still holds very much true. Well, I hope you're right. I get pretty discouraged sometimes when I think about maybe the last two generations and uh, the way history has been revised and what they believe versus what is actually true. <laughs> it's just a different set of beliefs. I mean, you look at the way socialism has kind of taken hold, and it worries me. Look, you've got absolutely every right to be worried, Jason. I mean, it's fair to say that the United States of America is not living up to its potential, and that young people in the United States of America don't know what it means to be an American anymore. And they don't have an appreciation of the founding documents that I was discussing a few moments ago. And that's a real concern because the only way that the American model can survive is if people know what is required for the model and they have the confidence to defend it and advocate for it. So it is definitely something to be concerned about, to be aware about and to be vigilant about. But ultimately, optimism is a very American thing. And uh, I think that we've got a lot of reason to be optimistic as Americans. We're still the greatest country in the world with all of our problems and all of our challenges and all of the threats that face us. There is no other place where I would rather be. I always say that if you're born in the United States of America or the day that you move to the United States of America is the day that you win the lottery of life mm -hmm. and you get this incredible head start on anyone and everyone everywhere else. And I, I really feel that. And that's why America remains the number one destination for all types of immigrants, legal and illegal. No question about it. So I love studying history. And I, I uh, about a year ago, I finished that series, World War II in Color, which was quite interesting to me. And, and by the way, you know, seeing these uh, historical films colorized, it really does bring it to life. I hate to seem like color is that big a deal, but it really is, at least for me. I've been watching uh, lately uh, something called America in Color, another series. And of course, they've got their revisionist aspects. But just the fact that it's in color makes it so much more real, at least to me. And Churchill is, is such an interesting character. He seemed to have so much amazing faith and uh, strength, fortitude. And without him, I, I really think World War II may well have turned out differently. Well, what are your thoughts? I agree with you, Jason. I think I'd probably be speaking Japanese and you might be speaking German. Well, there is a uh, show about that. <laughs> you know, that's the <laughs> man in the high castle, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, look, it would have been very different had Churchill not been around. Uh, Churchill was a disruptor. He was a 
catalyst for change. He was one of those people that decided to upend what was the the norm and convention. Of course, Churchill was half American, a point that's often overlooked. His mother was American. And I like to say that I think one of the reasons why Americans who typically don't really have a strong interest in what happens elsewhere in the world, they tend to be more America-focused, I think that's one of the reasons why Winston Churchill is an exception. And many Americans, particularly older Americans, have a real affinity for Churchill and and he resonates with them. And I think Mm -hmm. that's because he was very American. I mean, he was a guy that uh, was opinionated and, and, and not timid at all, very powerful, very bold. He embraced risk, was very ambitious. I mean, he was, yeah, he really acted out his life like an American. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting. So do you think Trump and Churchill are are similar in, in some ways? Well, that's why I wrote the book, Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization. I wrote the book, Jason, because I consider both men to actually be remarkably similar. And in my research for the book, I discovered that there were incredible parallels between the times and the men. Both men, of course, unique, historic, consequential. Uh, Trump's fight is on the inside. Churchill's fight was on the outside. Churchill was conquering the Axis powers and Trump conquering the swamp. But, you know, on first blush, when you look at it, you really wouldn't see the, the comparison. I mean, Churchill was five foot six and loved to have a drink. Trump's a six foot three teetotaler. Churchill famously napped in his pyjamas every opportunity he got. Donald Trump, by all accounts, barely sleeps. Right, yeah. One was this soaring, compelling orator. The other, not so much. Yeah. Uh, one began their career by imposing tariffs, the other by introdu- uh, by, sorry, by opposing tariffs, uh-huh. uh, one, uh, you know, by introducing them. So on, on that level, very different men. Uh-huh. But as soon as you drill down a little bit, uh, what you find, Jason, is that both of them remarkably similar, both intensely disliked, even hated, both loved their country, both alpha males, both clear thinkers and plain speakers, both had an acrimonious relationship with the media, both endured battles with the political establishment seeking their destruction, both followed leaders that were widely regarded as very weak. Of course, Churchill had Neville Chamberlain and Donald Trump had uh, Barack Obama. Uh, So, And in fact, in my book, Trump and Churchill, we go and and reproduce excerpts from British national newspapers from the late 1930s, early 1940s. And if I didn't tell you, Jason, that those excerpts were from British national newspapers at that time about Winston Churchill, you might think that I was quoting from the New York Times or the Washington Post Hmm. about Donald Trump. So identical are the criticisms. So identical are the accusations, uh, that they're overconfident, that they're too optimistic, Mm -hmm. that they don't listen to anybody around them. All of that kind of stuff that that we see spoken about Donald Trump, Winston Churchill had to endure. That's really really interesting. You know, I didn't know that much about Churchill. And I mean, it seems to me looking at history, like he was this popular leader that really united people and, well, I mean, at least on his side, of course, and sort of imparted his strength to a country that was unsure and wary. But you're saying he had all those same criticisms and was widely hated. Well, you know, half of the country, I guess I should say, like Trump, right? I mean, half the country loves him. So I guess, uh, you know, that's polarization for you, right? Well, certainly the people in positions of power and influence like the elites, whether they were in the government, whether they were in the political parties, whether they were in the media, those people had a real venom for Winston Churchill. Uh, They didn't like him. They didn't think he looked like a prime minister. They didn't take him seriously. He was too arrogant for them. I mean, he was was their worst nightmare in, in many ways, similar to how Donald Trump is perceived by bureaucrats and the former presidents and many people in Congress and even many people in his own party like Mitt Romney. 
So the comparisons, the parallels are really incredible when you when you when you get down. That that's what blew me away as I was writing Trump and Churchill Defenders of Western Civilization. Hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. What else would you like people to know, uh, you know, either about the boomerang or or the comparison of, of uh Trump and Churchill? Well, Jason, I you, look history repeats itself and you have to really be aware uh, of that and and know how to see things and Donald Trump came on the scene politically at a time when a lot of everyday Americans were hurting. Their confidence uh, had taken a hit. They had not been made to feel comfortable to celebrate their patriotism or have their patriotism be a focal part of their life and the, the, the culture. And Donald Trump comes along and, and gives that to them. And, and in many ways, Winston Churchill gave that same kind of confidence and assurance. You know, we, we see now uh, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio came out and, and uh, blasted President Trump for being or for peddling false optimism. And uh, it's funny because Churchill was accused of exactly the same thing hmm. because he, he would get on a radio address and he would remind people of, of sunnier days past and he would promise them sunny days in the future. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the world that was going through its darkest hours, many people thought that that was irresponsible, mm-hmm. that that was wrong, that that was him underplaying what was going on. And in the same way, CNN's Wolf Blitzer accused the president of belittling the enormity of the crisis in relation to COVID-19. You can't win. That's the bottom line here. You know, no matter yeah. what Trump does, the media will hate him. It's just ridiculous, really. That's exactly right, Jason. Yeah, yeah unbelievable. Well, where do we go from here? And uh, wrap it up for us. Give out your website. Uh, look, uh, where do we go to from here? Uh, always believe in America. Never bet against America. Understand who we are, where we come from, what we do. In every one of us, there's a little bit of our founding fathers still. Be optimistic. It's not American to be sit around with slumped shoulders. This is the greatest country in the world despite all the problems that we have. Uh, we're very lucky to have a president of the of the medal and, and strength and fortitude and leadership of uh, Donald Trump. And we can win this. We can bounce back. We can do everything. If you'd like to know more about me, go to nickadamsusa.com. That's nickadamsusa.com. If you'd like to order Trump and Churchill, go to amazon.com. That's amazon.com. And you'd be good to go. Yeah, good stuff. Nick, one last question for you. How do you think history will look at Trump compared to the way he's viewed today? Either positive, negative, whatever. Yeah, I think it'll be very different to what it is today. I think Donald Trump will very much be a Van Gogh president. Uh, That is to say, one probably not appreciated in his lifetime. It will be with the passage of time that Donald Trump will be seen more objectively. And potentially, as I make out in uh, the case for in my book, Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization, potentially be one of the greatest figures of the 21st century. We've got a long way to go in that century, but... It's it's very possible that he will become the Winston Churchill of the 21st century uh, Mm -hmm. from a historical perspective. Nick, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.